gallon tank, soft corals with fluorescent lighting. You get successful with that, then you start greedy, getting greedy, and you go, I need to go bigger, and I need to start keeping acroperas and other stony corals, which would need more light, right? So they move on to a 55 gallon tank, transfer everything you have from the 29, you put the acros in there, and you create a mixed reef, and using metal halides this time, right? Pretty much, again, you know, you outgrow these things, and you get confident about your reef keeping skills, so you moved into a new house and said, you know, I'm going to jump to a 180-gallon tank. Right. So back in 95, jumped into a 180-gallon tank with mostly SPS corals. And then for 10 years, I had that tank and then decided to jump to a 500-gallon tank. By now, I was a glutton for punishment. But I also thought that I learned a lot and I could manage a 500-gallon reef tank. Right. Started that off with metal halides. And then since 2006, so that's almost... 16 years now, replace the metal halides with LEDs. So that's currently what I'm doing. This is what I've been running with. Uh, and over the years, you know, like any other hobbyists, it's not always one tank. Tanks multiply. At one point, there were eight tanks in the house, and my wife felt I was the house was getting overwhelmed with aquariums and water on the floor and all the other issues that go with it. So pretty much I've downscaled now, and I'm down to one 500-gallon tank with a couple of freshwater aquariums now. So, and they're all in the basement. So, you know, during the course of keeping reefs, I also was breeding fish. I used to breed a lot of clownfish at one time too. So that's a little bit of the background. This was one of my other tanks that eventually has crashed now, all right? So I've made that mistake here. Interestingly, the reason it crashed is what happens when you're in the reef keeping business for a long time and you get lazier and lazier over time, all right? The tank was doing well, it required no work, and I said, you know, I'll just let it run and I'll just keep, keep, let it keep going, I'll take care of it as minimally as I can. And then one day all the corals started to drop and droop and start to die, and I said, you know, let me just check the water and see if the water quality is good, like most of us do. Most of the water quality, the parameters were good, but I had not, never tested the salinity in the tank. It had creeped up to 44. So that was the end of that, that tank. So one of the, the points I want to make is that yeah, you know, we are all, you feel you're expert reef keeper, but there's a downside to that. You start getting lazy, you start getting confident, right? And I think that's when a lot of the issues will catch up with you. So don't let that happen to you. Don't let tanks slip away. But it's very hard to just keep on a regular regimen for 30 plus years, and I found that that is not easy to do. Reef keeping, I always thought was a piece of cake after doing it for so long, but there are issues that I still don't have answers to, and a lot of people in the hobby claim to have answers to, but I don't think they have the answers either. If you've ever kept stony corals, one of the problems that you run into, and this happened to my tank after about seven or eight years of growing corals like crazy. You come down one morning and you look at the tank, and all of a sudden there's a big patch of tissue that's just peeling off the coral, and you wonder what happened to it. You go back to, just happens in the morning, you look at it, you go off to work, come back in the evening and by then there's another coral that's happening too. In the past I've always tried to save the coral, take it, cut it out, try to save the pieces, but never really had good success with saving the coral once it starts to RTN, especially at this pace where it's suddenly it's just going at a very rapid pace. So this is one of the issues that I've struggled with over the years. Once, once you get RTN, it's very hard to stop it. And I've tried many, many strategies based on my conversations with a lot of my esteemed reef keeping friends, I've tried lots of things that they recommended, but none of them seemed to work. And at one point, I just threw my arms up in the air and I said, you know what? I'm just gonna do nothing, let this thing ride its way through, and maybe it'll stop or take down everything. Fortunately, it stopped. But you do end up losing quite a bit of coral. Other issues that you struggle with and very hard to get away from is pest. If you've ever kept stony corals these days, you're very likely to find these acro-eating flatworms that'll show up on the corals. Um, I've had to deal with these Montipora-eating nudibranchs that will wipe out Montipora colonies in a few days. Yeah, they multiply really fast. Very, very hard to get out of the tank once they get into your tank. I probably still have the acro-eating flatworms in my tank. And once in a while, their population will explode. And then sometimes the population just kind of dies back to very small numbers. Corals sometimes can deal with it, but when the population gets really big, then they have a hard time dealing with it. And the larger corals can seem to manage this much better than 
the smaller frags. They get overwhelmed when they get attacked by these aggravating flatworms. The key is to keep them out of your tank. And these days, at least, you can get lots of different dips and so on to try and treat the corals and dip them before you put them in your tanks to remove some of these pests before they get into the tank. In a 500-gallon tank, it's very hard to remove pests. And Joe can tell you, in a 20,000-gallon tank, it's, it's actually impossible to get rid of them. But even with dipping, some of these pests manage to get through. You can dip the corals, you can knock off the adults from the colonies, but the eggs can get through. And that's how I think they got back into my tank. I was very careful, but they still got in there. Some of the eggs somehow got in and eventually multiplied. So pests are definitely a big struggle with reef keeping. And it's very important to A, buy from places that are supposedly keeping their tanks pest free. Don't assume that the coral is pest free no matter where you get it from. Treat it like it always has pests. Quarantining is the best strategy, but most of us don't want to set up an extra tank to just quarantine corals for a long time, and we want to put the coral right away in the tank. Always want to, so sometimes you'll get these pests going. So one of the things that I've also done is I always cut off the base of any coral that I put in my tank now. So that removes the dead rock, and that's where the eggs of these pests usually appear. So that's a good strategy. Other struggles that I've had in the past is the, what I'm going to call mysterious fish, fish deaths. It's again one of those things where the, these fish were perfectly fine the night before, and in the morning they were all dead. These were not cheap fish, as you can see. There are some expensive fish in here. There's a gem tank, there's a couple of karamabis, there was a joculator angel, and these fish were in my system for five years at least. What can suddenly cause them to die? I couldn't figure it out. So I replaced these fish over time, and a few years later, the same thing happens again. This time, I think I found the cause. This tank has been, this is my second, second tank, not the big one. It's been set up for at least 10 years. I always had sea cucumbers in that tank. And one of the sea cucumbers climbed in, got into the pump. My guess is it killed all the fish. And the reason I think it's a sea cucumber is because when I saw the sea cucumber wrapped around there, there was my other joculator who was still alive, but he was floating sideways. I quickly grabbed it out of there and put it in fresh salt water from my other tank, and it revived. So clearly there was a poisoning going on somehow, and that poisoning came from these sea cucumbers. So be very, very careful if you're going to put sea cucumbers in your tank, and there is a way for them to get into your pumps. And these are not the sea apple type ones. These are the ones that live on the sand. So you don't expect them to climb up the glass and get into a pump intake. So from now on, I would never, ever keep a sea cucumber in a tank, especially a tank with expensive fish in it. Another incident with these mysterious fish deaths. This is in another tank that I manage at Penn State, which is also a 500-gallon tank. And one time we decided that that tank had become overgrown with palithoas, and we said we need to remove some of these palithoas, or at least remove the rock with the palithoa. So there's a huge rock that was covered with palithoa. All we did was we took that rock out of that tank. Next morning, all the fish in that tank were dead. 50 fish were dead. Four o'clock in the morning, I'm getting a phone call from the janitor at Penn State saying, you want to come and see this, all your fish are dead. And I just laughed and I said, are you, are you sure they're dead? He's like, yeah, they're floating upside down. Is that how they sleep? I said, no. <laughs> Quickly ran over and sure enough, they were all dead. We couldn't figure it out why they would die. So this beautiful big rock covered with palitoa, this friend of mine who helps me with the aquarium says, you know, I can't, so says, why don't I, I'll take this rock and put it in my tank. So he takes it home. The next day he calls me and says, all my fish are dead. So then we knew it was the rock covered with palitoa that got stressed when we removed it and they released some toxin that killed the fish. That rock story even goes further than that. So he takes that rock, he got so pissed when his fish were dead, he threw it in his backyard and left it there. Two years later, I asked him, I said, hey, you still have that rock in your backyard? He goes, yeah. I said, I want that rock. So he took that rock, because now by now it had dirt and stuff on it. He took that rock and put it in his bathtub to wash it. Of course, we live in Pennsylvania, it's cold, so you always use warm water. He fainted, he fainted. His wife had to come and rescue him and, and he ended up going to the hospital. So true, absolutely true story. It's my first experience with dealing with some kind of these palithotoxins. So again, be careful with some of these corals that you put in your tank. They can, all corals at some point are going to grow and cover lots of area. And the more poisonous these corals are, the more they seem to want to grow. So know your corals, know what you're putting in your tank, and make sure you stay away from some of these 
corals that are ver very poisonous. Other struggles, how many of you have dealt with dinoflagellates before? Pretty much anybody who keeps a reef tank has had to deal with dinoflagellates at some point. Especially these days, I'm finding that there's more and more instances of people setting up tanks and having to deal with dinoflagellates. And I, I think, again, this is my hypothesis, that it has a lot to do with the low, low level of nutrients that we end up with when we start a reef tank. And a lot of instances, I think, are based on the fact that the tanks, when we start them up, they're really, really sterile. We use dead rock. We don't even use sand anymore. Some people don't even use sand. And there's no nutrients in that tank at all. So the initial life forms that, they, that populate the tank, like dinoflagellates, tend to thrive in those kind of environments. And they are very, again, dinoflagellates are not easy to get rid of either. They always exist in every tank. So if you're str struggling with dinoflagellates, the strategy that seems to work for me has been to use UV. Use a strong UV sterilizer, run the water through it. Because these type of dinoflagellates, especially the ones that look like this, they can be killed by UV. They also, in the daytime, they tend to stick to the rock and the sand, and they're photosynthetic. So you'll often see bubbles and stuff sticking on them. But at night, they become free swimming. So that's a good time when they actually can enter into the UV sterilizer, and that's when you can kill them. So one strategy is to maybe when you're doing this, is turn off the lights, okay, for a couple of days, keep most of them free floating, and hope that they actually end up in your UV sterilizer and you can reduce their numbers. Cyano, if you tell me that you've been reefing for 20 years and you've never had cyano, come and see me afterwards, okay? <laughs> cyano is another one that most reef keepers, at some point or the other, have to struggle with. Uh, this is a tank that I, again, this was my 75 gallon tank that I was setting up, and I set it up with dead rock and sand and very low nutrient system. And once I got rid of the dinoflagellates from there, what pops up? Cyanobacteria. And my attitude towards cyano has always been, it's always there in my tank, I'll just let it run, and eventually it'll go away. Which it usually does in my big tank. I'll get patches of it, I don't do anything, it eventually goes away. But this tank, it just wouldn't go away. It was getting worse and worse by the day. So when I killed the dinoflagellates, the dinoflagellates released all these nutrients that were embedded in those guys. That was enough for the cyanobacteria to take hold. Cyanobacteria, you can eliminate with some chemicals, like chemi clean. That seems to have worked for me. But I don't like putting too many chemicals in the tank. So use it as a last resort, okay, if you have to. But it does work. But once again, remember, when you kill these things, they are re-releasing their nutrients. So you better have some way of getting rid of those nutrients. Otherwise, they'll be just floating in the water and now appear in the form of some other algae. So exporting the nutrients when you start killing these things, okay, is also very important. Yeah, cyanobacteria, it can get really thick, right? So this was uh, some pictures of what, how bad it was looking, and this wasn't the worst picture. It got really worse than that even. Everybody's favorite, aptasia. That's another thing that gets into the reef tanks and can take over a reef tank very quickly. Especially if you're like me, who has a lot of fish, and you feed a lot, you're also feeding these aptasia a lot. So here's one of my tanks where you can see the aptasia has basically become the dominant uh, creature in the tank. And it was, they sting. They sting the other corals. And getting rid of the aptasia, that's another hard one. When you have a large tank with lots of aptasia, injecting each one with some chemical doesn't seem to work. And every time I've tried to inject these aptasia to kill them, I found that they come back with a vengeance. They come back even more than what I had before. Their tissue disintegrates and that tissue just lands somewhere and starts regrowing again. But there are certain things that work with aptasia. Those, those lasers, those fancy lasers don't work for me either. I wouldn't recommend using those either. If you have one or two, you may be able to get rid of them, but if you have so many of them, you'll never get rid of them. Fish that eat aptasia are a good solution. There are several fish that will eat aptasia, but the risk is that they might eat other things too. So there are some fish that I have found that are fairly safe, reef safe, as well as they'll hunt down the aptasia. The one I like the most is the marginalis butterfly. Copper bands will eat them, but copper bands are notoriously hard to keep alive. A lot of people kill a lot of copper bands before they can get one to live. But marginalis seem to come, they're pretty hardy. I've had one that lasted me for 15 years and just recently died. So my reef doesn't have any aptasia because of that fish. There are other fish that people claim that will eat them. Uh, the bristle file fish, they're supposed to eat them. Well, I did put them in my tank, but they also ended up eating all my zoanthid. Right? They started taking chunks of the leather corals too. 
you might end up with situations where a fish might work and other situations that same fish won't work or it'll cause you more harm. So it's always touch and go with that. The other bad thing about aptasia is once they're in your system and you think you've got them cleared, no. They're hiding in your pipes, they're hiding in your sump, they're hiding everywhere. And as soon as a predator fish is gone, they start appearing all over again. But yeah, so fish work, and my copper band really did a good job. Not copper band, the marginalis did a good job. Another one that I haven't found a good solution to yet is these vermitted snails. These are little snails that live in a tube, and they'll make sure the tube grows, and they, they come out to feed. They cast like a mucus net. Food particles get stuck on these mucus nets, and then they pull those nets in, okay? And that's how they feed. And they multiply fast, too. Once they're in my system, I haven't found any way to get rid of these. I've gone in and tried to crush their tubes. I put super glue on their tubes to try to force them to stay inside, but they burrow right through the super glue. Or they pop out on the side somewhere. So these things, they irritate corals when the mucus net lands on the corals. They do irritate the corals. They don't really kill them. It looks ugly. When you have a lot of these, you see these mucus nets all over the place, especially after I feed, not easy to get rid of. Especially, the, they love parietes for some reason. You know, they'll get on the parietes the most, but they'll grow everywhere. Another ongoing struggle has been clams. I've tried many, many times to try to keep clams, and they don't seem to last more than a year or two. So my, I advise people don't even bother with clams anymore. I know they're very pretty, they look beautiful. I've had them grow out from little one-inch clams. I've had them grow out to four or five inches and still manage to lose them. And uh, this is only a part of my collection of dead shells. Flatworms. These are different flatworms, right? These are the flatworms that are not the acro-eating kind of flatworms, but they show up on soft corals. So these are some that, again, I haven't found anything that eats them. Sometimes they'll multiply. You see a lot of them on the corals, and then they irritate the corals. The corals won't open as much as they used to before. But somehow there's some biological thing going on with these. I usually let them go, and their numbers will decline over time. And then when something happens in the tank, the numbers might increase again. Right? But I've gotten them down to where they were sitting on every coral, and you could count 20 of them on every coral, every soft coral, or more even. Now if you look at that tank, there's like one or two here and there. They disappeared on their own. Another struggle of mine is, what do you do with corals when they grow too big? When you have a 500-gallon tank, you think that, eh, it'll last me for 20 years without the corals having to be a problem. No. This was a frag that I put in the tank. It was a frag. Five years later, it was that big. It killed a lot of other corals by, by shading them out. You buy these little frags, you don't know what this coral is going to become. You don't know what shape it's going to take. So when, they get, when I bought this, they told me, oh, it's going to be a branching coral. So I put it up in the back of my tank. I put it up high enough in the tank. No, it wasn't a branching coral. It started to go plate and essentially killed a lot of coral that were growing underneath it by shading them. So my friend Joe here, who didn't want to believe me when I said, Joe, come and take this coral. Yeah, he'll tell you later on at 2 o'clock about his 20,000 gallon tank. And I said, you have a 20,000 gallon tank? Joe goes, eh. A lot of people tell me they have huge corals, right, Joe? And he never, he's like, eh, but every time I go pick them up, they're not, it's not that big. So Joe comes in with his five gallon buckets and a, what was that, like a Rubbermaid container. We, it didn't fit, even the Rubbermaid container. He had to go to Lowe's and buy a bigger container for it. So yes, coral growth can be a problem too. It's not always the best thing. Other struggles that are not completely my fault are failures of equipment and technology. You start using technology with your systems. You start to rely on the technology. And when you think you really are confident with the technology, it fails. And the damage can be pretty significant, right? So here's a little graph to show you what happened to my tank. And I remember this very well because it was a Miami Magna. I was in Miami for the Magna, enjoying myself, not concerned about my tank because I was running a Neptune controller. I had programmed it to send me a message if something went wrong. And I was like, ah, I haven't been getting messages from my tank. Everything is probably fine. I'm partying away, having fun. Went back home, parked the car in the garage. Before I even got out of the car, I told my wife, my tank is dead. She's like, what, how do you know? I said, can't you smell it? I can smell dying Acropora from like a mile away. <laughs> The moment I was there, I said, you deal with the car, you deal with everything, I'm running to the tank to see what's going on. Coral's dying, fish dead, and I go, what happened? So I look at my controller, tank is at 90 degrees. My chiller is still running. No message from my controller to tell me the tank is running this hot. 
And you can see from this graph here, it was doing it for five straight days. It was hit, going over 90 degrees every day. What do you do when you hit a tank that's 90 degrees? My wife, I said, turn around, go to the gas station and buy as much ice as you can. She came home with eight bags of ice. I put them all in the tank, in the tank and the sump, right? Within an hour, all that ice had melted and my temperature only dropped like two degrees. I don't know how many, I think I went through like 36 bags of ice to try to bring the temperature down. And you can see how, I was trying to bring it down very quickly, okay? Because I said, maybe if I do that, I'll rescue some of the fish and I'll rescue some of the corals too. Right? So you can see the graph dropping there. That's me bringing the temperature down by dumping bags and bags of ice into that tank. So once that was all done, you can look back and say, well, let me go back and why, why did this happen? First of all, why did the chiller not keep the tank cool? The Freon leaked. So it was no longer functioning as a chiller. It was actually adding heat to the tank. Secondly, so why did my controller not send me a message? Turns out that a few days before the conference, the mail server that I was using, which was recommended by the manufacturer, changed their protocol. It was no longer communicating with my phone. The only way to figure this out was to go to their bulletin boards and keep checking these things, right? No, nobody told me about it. Once again, you have technology, technology can't fail you, you still have to keep on top of technology. So now what I do is, every day at nine o'clock in the morning, I have my controller send me a message. Right? My phone beeps, I get my message, that it's talking to my phone. So every day at nine o'clock, my wife goes, your girlfriend's calling you again. So this is the aftermath of that. This is a laundry tub full of dead corals. And this is only half of it. And that also led to a lot of fish losses once again. I lost a lot of my, it's always the expensive fish that die first. So over the years, I mean, these are some of the struggles of reef keeping. Right? Some we can have answers to, there are others that we're still fi fighting to find answers to. And finally, the last thing to overcome is what I'm gonna call stupid human mistakes. We've all done this. Do some dumb thing, ends up in a problem. And usually, something that you don't think through, or you overthink, and then you forget. I used to do this frequently. Every time I did a water change, there'd be water on the floor. So I would drain the water, hook up the hose to fill it up. It takes a while. In the meantime, I go feed my other fish, I do some other things. Then my wife calls me to come and do some, help her with something. I go up, and then I've forgotten that I had this water change going on. Overflows the tank completely. That's one category of stupid human mistakes. I mean, I have alarms now on my floor that if the water hits the floor, it's gonna send me an alarm. Still happens. Filling up an RO container. I don't know how many times I have overfilled those containers. Now it's all automated with valves and everything else. It doesn't happen that frequently. One time, I was in a pinch. I was doing water changes. Ended up removing too much water from my tank. Tried to replace it, there wasn't enough. And I said, ah, no big deal, I'll just use tap water. I didn't have enough RO water, I'll just use tap water. It's only a little bit of a tap water I'm gonna put in there. Things should be okay. No. They weren't okay. The tap water has chloramines in there, which I didn't realize that had an impact on the reef again. I've had things like lights crashing into my tank. You hang the lights from the ceiling, and I thought I had it all screwed in nicely in there, and one of the wires broke, it got rusted over the years, didn't pay attention to it, and broke and dumped my light in the tank. And it was, it was a metal halide light. So that bulb explodes in the tank. It's got a lot of mercury and other heavy metals in those lamps, they're all in the tank. For two years, we couldn't keep a fish in that tank. It took two years before that somehow got out of the system. But for two years we tried, the fish just wouldn't live. Corals were fine, the fish wouldn't live. That's kind of my story here for this talk. Give you a flavor for some of the struggles that I've had to deal with over the 25 plus years and hope that you learn from these things and don't make the same mistakes that I did or at least give you some solutions to some of the problems that at least worked for me. I'm gonna stop here and take any questions you might have. All right, so the question is, how do I deal with ick and marine velvet in a reef tank? The best way to deal with it is to have quarantine your fish. Once it gets into your tank, you're gonna be fighting it for a long time. And there's no easy way to fight it. So I'm very careful with fish, right? I've had fish in my tank now that are 15, 20 years old. I don't wanna lose them. So I always try to buy from people who I know are providing fish that have been quarantined. And even then, I don't trust them all the way. When I get a fish, I usually buy from people who have quarantined it. When I get it, I have a separate tank. Well, I might hold that fish for two or three months. In the olden days, when I was first in the hobby, I'd buy the fish at the store and dump it in my tank. I lost a lot of fish that way. Don't do it anymore. Quarantine, buy from reputable places. If you can see the fish, that's, that's good. But with these days with mail order, you don't know what you might get. If you see a fish in the store that has anything on it, never buy it don't think that you'll be able to cure it. Just don't buy it. Ick is an interesting one, because sometimes if your fish are healthy, 
and they, they get a little bit of ache, they can, they can deal with it. I mean, I have an Achilles tang in my tank, which every six months will show up with some spots of ache, no matter what. But it doesn't seem to kill the fish or hurt the fish. That ache doesn't spread to the other fish either, but that fish will always, he always gets it. And once ache gets into your tank, it's not leaving your tank. It's always there. Assume it's always there. All right, I'll take another one or two questions if there are any, uh, just to stay on time. Right now, I have a 500 gallon reef tank. It's doing good, it's doing good right now. Yeah, except my nitrates are too high. <laughs> There's no algae in spite of those high nitrates. So that's good. Okay, one last question. I do both. I have freshwater tanks too. I've, based, I've not dealt with it too much, but I dealt with it once. But I found that if you have a lot of plants in there that are growing fast, they tend to lower, reduce the uh, algae issues that you have. So fast growing plants and a lot of them, again, it helps a lot. All right, I'm gonna stop here. Thanks a lot.